Hello and welcome to the Air and Space live chat. Today we are talking all about the Wright Brothers. I'm Marty Kelsey, one of the hosts of STEM and 30, an Emmy-nominated TV show for middle school students produced by the National Air and Space Museum, and we've got a great show for you today. We are joined by Tom Crouch, Curator Emeritus at the National Air and Space Museum, and Keith Yorg, who is a relative of the Wright Brothers. Keith and Tom, thank you all so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. All right, we've got a great show for you. We're gonna start with a couple of questions that I'm gonna ask, but then we wanna get into your questions. So please put those in the comment section down below. Also, let us know where you're watching from. We would love to give you a shout out. So Tom, let's start with you. Give us a little bit of information about who were the Wright brothers and why were they so important? Well, the Wright brothers uh, were these two guys from Dayton, Ohio, who literally changed the world. They changed the way we do things. And it isn't just the fact that these two guys change the way we travel or the way we practice commerce or the way we make war. Because people had dreamed for millennia about flying and suddenly here it was, these two guys had actually done it. It was like opening a door on the new century. Gosh, if we're able to fly, if flesh and blood people like me can actually build a machine that'll carry them into the sky, what can't we do? So just had an enormous impact. Awesome. Well, we've got folks already tuning in from Texas, Baltimore, Columbia, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, Damascus, Maryland, Dayton, Ohio's tuning in, Tennessee and Kentucky. Awesome. Thank you all for tuning in and watching today. Please submit your questions down in the comments section. Now, Keith, you've got a great connection to the Wright brothers. How are you related to them? Yeah, so uh, Orville and Wilbur never got married or had any kids, uh, but they had two older brothers who both did, uh, Ruchlin and Lauren. Uh, and so I am a direct descendant of Lauren. Uh, he is my great-great-grandfather, so uh, Orville and Wilbur are my great-great-granduncles. Awesome. And um, just so everybody watching knows, we... Uh, we actually reached out to Keith's mom yesterday and uh, we asked her if she had any really great pictures. And so she sent us a few that you'll be seeing throughout the program today. I think some fr from some Centennial in Flight celebrations. Um, so we'll be checking those out. Now, Keith, I want to ask you, you know, growing up, you knew you were a relative of the Wright brothers. How did that kind of influence your path? Well, I'd say the big thing was uh, back in 2003, uh, there was, like you mentioned, the centennial celebrations for the 100th anniversary of the first flight. Uh, and so that was an entire year's worth of events. Uh, and so I got to go to several air shows. They had a whole week long of stuff down in Kitty Hawk where the Wright brothers flew for the first time. Uh, and I got to do some stuff like meeting Neil Armstrong and John Glenn. Uh, I went hang gliding with Dan Barry, who is a space shuttle astronaut, uh, on the dunes uh, in North Carolina. Um, and so that's just kind of, I mean, just unreal to do that sort of stuff and to, I mean, I was 13 years old at the time. Uh, and so that was just so impactful and it really solidified that, hey, I want to, th these are cool guys doing really cool stuff. I want to be a part of that. So that's why I ended up uh, getting into engineering. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got some questions coming in. Uh, make sure you put those questions down in the comments section. Liverpool, London, Buenos Aires, Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, Ames, Iowa, California, Florida, St. Louis, Fayetteville, New York, the Ukraine. Ukraine's been tuning into all of these. And Montana, thank you all for watching. We appreciate it. Uh, Tom, our first question coming in is for you. How did they build the right flyer? Was it with spare parts and did they have a sponsor? No, the Wrights were always very proud of the fact that they paid for the whole thing themselves. Um, uh, the cost of building all those airplanes, three gliders, three powered flying machines between um, their first trip to Kitty Hawk in 1900 and their ultimate practical airplane in 1905. So now they paid for everything. People would sometimes offer them support and money, but the rights always wanted uh, people to know that they had done this uh, themselves. Obviously, intellectually, they stood on the shoulders of people who would come before them, but um, financially and in terms of those last problem solving, it was all them. Did they build the flyer from spare parts out of their bike shop? 
Uh, no, no spare parts. Although when you look at the flyer, you can tell that it was built by people who knew something about bicycles. Uh, the transmission, for example, that connects the engine to the propellers is uh, bicycle sprockets and chain, big motorcycle chain, not bicycle chains. And uh, you can see other pieces of bike chain uh, throughout uh, the airplane. So um, the, the bicycle played another important part too. It taught them a lot about balance and uh, how you do that kind of thing that um, was real important to them. Awesome. And I always think it's great when you can go into the National Air and Space Museum and you see the right flyer there. There's a bike that the Wright brothers built right next to it. And to see that along with the right flyer, you know, in one one view, I always think is really cool to see those connections. Um, all right, Keith, we've got a question that maybe you can take a, a whack at. Um, what role did their sister play in the Wright brothers' success? Yeah, so their sister was really supportive. Um, she actually shared a birthday with Orville. Uh, I believe Tom, it was three years later. I, I can't remember the-, the uh, It was, uh, she was three years younger to the day than Orville, yep. Yeah, so that always kind of was a bond between them. Um, and, you know, she was instrumental really, especially after um, they had successfully developed the airplane and were trying to market it. Um, so when they, we're trying to sell it to the uh, U.S. Army and to um, governments uh, in Europe. You know, she traveled and was a really popular figure uh, in, in a lot of those European countries. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got some schools checking in. Miss uh, Donna's class from Avery's Creek Elementary in Asheville, North Carolina, as well as Greenwood Friends School, fifth and sixth and seventh graders in Millville, Pennsylvania are tuning in. Thank you all so much. We appreciate you uh, you tuning in and let us know those, those questions down in the comments. Um, also, we've got uh, DC and my hometown, Kansas City, is tuning in. So that is awesome. Um, all right, we've got a, a question here that I, I think both of you guys can answer, but Tom, we'll start with you. Why did you want to start studying the Wright brothers? How'd that all happen? Well, like the Wright brothers, I was born in Dayton. Uh, so I kind of grew up with the story of the Wright brothers. And um, my dad was uh, an engineering technician at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the big research facility for half a century. So I not only grew up with the story of the Wright brothers, but I grew up with cutting edge airplanes and so on. And um, I, I used to um, work at a trap shoot on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which was right on the ground where the Wright brothers had flown in 1904 and 1905. After Kitty Hawk, they came back to Ohio and flew closer to home. And where they flew is now part of that Air Force base. So my history is kind of entwined with the, with the Wright brothers' story. And Keith, what was that like growing up knowing that you had those famous relatives? Well, it was, I, I would say, normally it didn't really uh, have a lot to do in my day to day, except in 2003, I did get kind of a lot of teasing from some of my classmates because I, you know, would leave school for a little while. Oh, you know, it's late to the right brothers. Uh -huh -huh. Um, but then, you know, for me, I'd say wanting to learn about them, uh, just knowing more about my family. Uh, and then, you know, Orville was such a tinkerer, uh, you know, from, from doing a printing press, bicycle shop. Um, when he passed away in 1948, he was working on an automatic record changer. And my grandmother remembers, he would ask all the family members, if you come over, bring over your old records because he had destroyed all of them. They had been flung across the room and shattered. <laughs> uh, and so I, I just love that even, you know, to his dying day, he was trying to understand and make things and, and do things. And so, you know, I, I, I like that too. Uh, so that's awesome yeah. all right we've got uh sam is doing a report on the wright brothers right now and she would like to know how many types of airplanes did orville and wilbur build or design well they started in 1899 with a kite uh, that they used to experiment with control and then they built a series of three gliders 1900 1901 1902 
And that's how they learn to uh, build wings, to control the airplane, that kind of thing. By 1903, they're ready for power and they built a 1903 airplane, a 1904 airplane, and a 1905 airplane. The 1903 airplane was the first successful powered controlled heavier than air machine, but it really isn't until they get to their 1905 airplane that they have a, a practical airplane. So that's six flying machines right there. Once they established the company, of course, they built other kinds of machines, but those first six were the keys to solving the puzzle of flight. All right. Um... We've got somebody wants to know, how did working in a bicycle shop help them in building their first airplane? Well, it helped them a lot. As I said, there you can see bicycle parts actually in the powered airplanes that the Wright brothers built. But beyond that, uh, it taught them a lot about control. You know, when you're riding a bicycle, um, you, it's, you imagine having to describe how to ride a bicycle to a Martian or somebody who's never seen one. What, you want me to roll down the street on these two thin little rubber tires and there are these handlebars I have to work and oh yeah, I have to balance. You know, it would sound as though you had to be the world's greatest acrobat to ride a bike. The Wrights knew that wasn't true. So when it came to thinking about controlling an airplane, um, they weren't afraid of giving the pilot complete control over his flying machine. And it turned out that was one of the real keys to success. Control. Now, Keith, Keith, we've got a picture of you um, that you can't see it right now, but we've got a picture of you on a right style glider. Um, looks like you're about 13 years old. What was that like? And I assume that that was down at Kitty Hawk. What was that experience like? And could you kind of feel some of what Tom was just talking about? Oh yeah, I mean, so that experience was amazing. It, it was in Kitty Hawk uh, on the sand dunes uh, and that was with the right experience team, uh, which was the team that put together the reproduction of the 1903 flyer um, that they flew during the, the celebration down in Kitty Hawk in 2003. And that I believe was their 1902 glider, uh, which they built to train those pilots that were gonna fly. Um, and Scott Crossfield, who, um, people might know is the, um, X-15 pilot, uh, first man to break Mach 2 and Mach 3 and, and had a huge hand in designing that, um, he was the, uh, trainer for those. And so he was there, he actually signed my logbook. So I'm a pilot and my first entry in my logbook is from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill in the 1902, uh, right glider signed by Scott Crossfield. So. That is pretty Awesome. That That's really cool. Um, we want to remind everybody, be sure to go down to the comments section and submit your questions here. See if you can stump Tom or Keith. We'd love to, to make that happen. Um, and I also want to encourage everybody to head over to the National Air and Space Museum webpage and look for Engineering the Right Way. We'll try to put the, uh, the link down in the comments section. It's a great website where you can actually design and build your own right flyer and see how you do flying it there at Kitty Hawk. So take a look at that. Um, Tom, somebody wants to know, what was the airplane made of? Uh, the airplane was made of wood and fabric and uh, wire. Um, the the uh, long pieces of the airplane were uh, made out of spruce. The bent parts, like the ribs, were ash. The fabric was just uh, unbleached muslin fabric. And uh, the wires, you know, were just, just uh, wires. So it was built out of pretty simple things that you can get um, in Dayton, Ohio, if you're living there in 1900. And something that I, I wanna point out to our viewers that um, until I came to work at the National Air and Space Museum, I don't think I fully comprehended. Tom, how long was fabric one of the predominant coverings of airplanes? Oh, for a very long time. Uh, through World War I, uh, it's, it's just before and during World War I that you begin to get some uh, metal uh, used in uh, fuselage and wings and so on. But it's really not until you get into the late 1920s and especially the 1930s when uh, airplanes are built out of metal and 
much stronger than, uh, you don't need biplane wings braced together anymore. Uh, you can build strong monoplanes and that kind of thing. So with, it's one of the great revolutionary changes in the history of aviation when you go from wood, wire, and fabric, in fact, to metal. So the next time you see a, a, an old, old airplane, take a look at it and look really closely because you can actually see the fabric on some of those those early ones. And it's just kind of mind blowing when you think about what they were doing in an airplane covered in fabric. Um, let's see, we've got Raleigh, North Carolina, Cincinnati, Bangalore, India, Lincoln, Nebraska, Asheville, North Carolina, Mexico, Fairfax, where I'm at right now, Farmington Hills, Michigan, and Medford, Oregon, all tuning in. Thank you all for watching and be sure to put those questions down in the comments section. Um, this can be for both of you. Did the Wright brothers realize how important their invention was and how much it would change the world? Uh, yes, they did. Um, they realized that it was revolutionary. I think they didn't um, realize how quickly uh, it would bring change uh, to the world. Uh, Wilbur Wright died in 1912, but Orville lived until uh, late 19, or early 1948, actually. So he lived to see jet airplanes, uh, rockets, the atomic bomb, and uh, really extraordinary that the amount of change that took place during the, the life of one of the inventors of the airplane. Wow. Keith, when you were a kid, did you play with model, model airplanes a lot? Uh, I would actually played more with paper airplanes. I remember once using like an entire ream of paper uh, with one of my friends out in the front yard and we had ended up um, doing a bunch of different designs and taping uh, rubber bands to the front. And by the end of the ream of paper, I was getting it across our lawn, across the street and into the neighbor's lawn. So. Nice. Now, Tom, talk a little bit about, and we've got a question about this. Um, somebody wanted to know if the Wright brothers threw things off of their roof when they were kids. Um, did they do that? But I, I do know that there's a story about a toy there. Uh, we don't know that they flew through anything off the roof. Uh, there was a famous poem uh, in the early 20th century called Darius Green and His Flying Machine. And the kid builds his flying machine and jumps out the barn and learns a, an important lesson in life, I think. Um, lots of things uh, had an impact on Wilbur and Orville, but one of the really important ones was the toy you were talking about. When uh, Wilbur was 11 and Orville was seven, their father, who was a minister, a church minister, uh, an important guy who traveled a lot. And he came back from one of those trips that year with a little toy helicopter. You wind up the blades and the rubber band stores the energy and you let it go and it bounces up against the ceiling. And um, they just had enormous fun with that. Of course, a toy like that's going to be fairly fragile, so it, I don't think it even survived the first day. But rather than doing what other kids might have done, go on to the next toy, Wilbur and Orville began to build their own copies of the little model and, again, learned really important lessons. They, they learned if you made it too big, it wouldn't fly anymore. So the whole notion of uh, weight in aerodynamics uh, was a lesson they learned right at the beginning. And in later life, when people ask them how they'd begun, they always told the story of their father and, and the little helicopter toy. So parents that are at home watching the, this with your, with your kids and your students, um, encourage them to make paper airplanes, make toys that fly and see what they can do because that engineering process, and Keith, you're, you're in engineering right now. Maybe you can talk a little bit about this. It's all about iteration and failing and trying something different, right? Oh yeah, um, it's that's absolutely all that engineering is about. Um, and you know, I think you learn more f when things don't succeed than when they do. Um, and the Wright brothers had a perfect example of that. If you look at their kites and their gliders, 1900 and 1901, those gliders weren't that good. Uh, they weren't performing the way they expected. The Wright brothers looked at; they had sent letters. Uh, Wilbur had sent a letter in the late 1800s to the Smithsonian asking for any literature that was available on flying. And they had done calculations and, you know, when they went out and tested it, they weren't getting the type of lift that they expected with the wind speeds and, and, and things that they had. Uh, and 
they just went back to the drawing board, uh, you know, developed their wind tunnel um, to get a better airfoil shape. Uh, found out that some of the Smeaton coefficient specifically, um, which was a, a well-known coefficient at the time uh, for windmills, I believe, was, was incorrect. Uh, and, you know, they would not have been able to do that without first having un some unsuccessful versions that they went back and checked and tried to improve. And then in 1902, they had a glider that was breaking records that stood for decades. That's awesome. All right. We've got students from uh, Avery's Creek Elementary in Asheville, and they want to know um, what type of engine did the first airplane have? Well, the Wright brothers built their own engine and for the 1903 airplane. They had a, a machinist, a mechanic in the bike shop named Charlie Taylor, who was really good with his hands. And so the brothers kind of put the idea of the engine together. Charlie did the building using just the real simple tools that he had in the bike shop, a drill press and uh, a little lathe and not much more. Um, other people were actually building more powerful engines at the same time. But when the Wright brothers did the calculations about weight and lift, and um, when they had an engine that had the right weight and produced they had calculated this, produced enough power so that they were sure they could get off the ground. They stopped there. They weren't out to invent uh, the world's best airplane engine. They were out to invent the airplane. And uh, they knew that the engine was a critical part of that, but everything has to, has to fit together. So uh, yeah, real important part of the airplane. Awesome. All right. We've got a question here uh, asking if you visited the right cycle shop and home at Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. And that's actually one that I can answer. I have been there. Um, and it's it's really interesting to walk in their shop, um, which Henry Ford actually moved from Dayton, Ohio up to, um, you know, up to uh, Dearborn, Michigan. And when you walk in the, the, the cycle shop, you know, the front of it's very much a store. And then you walk into the back and there's their workshop and some of the original equipment is still in there. And, and looking at it, what struck me was, wait a minute, it won't fit in here. Like the airplane doesn't fit inside the shop. And so, so can you all answer a little bit about that? Like, how did they do that? Did it ever get put together out in the yard or did they only put it together down in Kitty Hawk? Um, Actually, that bike shop, when it was brand new in the 1930s in Dearborn, after Henry Ford had moved it, he actually hired Charlie Taylor, who had built that first engine, to come to Dearborn and to meet people coming into the bike shop and to sort of be part of it. But the answer to your question is, um, yeah, they prefabbed it, if you will, in Dayton. They would... Uh, Cut the parts out, uh, the ribs, the spars, everything. They had the fabric all sewn and ready to go. And they would ship uh, all of that to Kitty Hawk and uh, reassemble it uh, down at their their uh, camp in Kitty Hawk. So, yeah, it is cool. Actually, uh, they did the 1903 airplane years after they had flown it at Kitty Hawk. Orville actually put it back together uh, in the back of the bike shop. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, as an historic thing, it was going on display. So it was actually assembled in the back of that bike shop later in 1960. Boy, there wouldn't have been much room to walk around, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got another question. I know you both have been there. Um, somebody wants to know what what was Kitty Hawk like when they were experimenting and what was life like when they were down there doing their experiments? So it was pretty rough. <laughs> the, you know, the Outer Banks, they, the Wright brothers picked the Outer Banks specifically. They had sent a letter to the um, weather service, the U.S. weather service to find areas with high consistent winds. I think Chicago was number one on the list. Um, but they also wanted some place that had sand so that while they were doing their testing, if something went awry, they had something soft uh, to crash into so that they wouldn't get injured. That was very important to their father, um, the, the Bishop Milton, that, that they do everything safely. Uh, and so 
you know, before they ever flew the glider, um, you know, without uh, it being tethered, they, they had uh, people there to help, but it was sparsely populated. Not many people. Um, their first, I believe, glider, they left uh, the glider itself there and some of the locals turned it into dresses for their daughters, the fabric from, from the glider. Um, so, you know, uh, I believe they took a train there and then had to take a boat from, from the mainland of North Carolina out to the, uh, uh, actual outer bank, you know, barrier islands there. And that, that trip wasn't always, uh, um, the easiest. Awesome. All right. Uh, um, he's oh, right. It, it was a really tough area. When you go to Kitty Hawk today, what you see is sort of a commemorative environment. You've got the big monument up on the hill and it's grassy and so on and so forth. In 19, uh, 1900, when they went down, somebody asked Orville in later years what it was like. And he said, Kitty Hawk was like the Sahara or the Sahara as I imagine it to be. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all right, uh, somebody wants to know if you can comment on the connection uh, between Orville and Charles Lindbergh. Did they know each other? Were they friends? Were they rivals? What was that connection like? Well, they weren't rivals because they were sort of a generation apart, but um, they certainly knew one another. When after Lindbergh flew the Atlantic in May of 1927, when he came back to this country, because people in St. Louis had paid for the airplane, the Spirit of St. Louis, the understanding was that he could have a big victory parade in New York and he could do something in Washington. And then he was supposed to go straight back to St. Louis so they could celebrate. In fact, Orville asked him if he would make a stop in Dayton on his way back to St. Louis. He was actually flying the Spirit of St. Louis. And so um, he landed. And uh, there was a big parade from Wright Field where he landed to Orville's mansion in the Oakwood part of, of Dayton. And uh, Orville had dinner for him. And the crowds outside were so enthusiastic. They were ruining, as Orville said, they're ruining my rose bushes. That Lindbergh finally agreed to step out on the little balcony and wave to the crowd of Daytonians who had come to see him. So. That's awesome. All right, we, Keith, we've got a question for you. Um, at what age did you realize how unique your experiences were? And was there like this aha moment for you? I mean, I think in the moment uh, when I was 13, it's, it's, it was pretty unique. I mean, I was a 13 year old being interviewed uh, for radio spots and things like that. And, um, you know, at the time I was very much uh, wanting to be an astronaut and go to Mars. I still want to be an astronaut. I think I would rather go to the moon now than Mars, honestly. Uh, but, but we'll see, maybe Elon can, can make that more of an easy trip. Um, but so I think there was a bit of excitement around that. So I, I, you know, did that. And then, you know, meeting people like John Glenn and Neil Armstrong, who, you know, not just my heroes, but international heroes, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of shocking. Um, so I think, I think really the, the 2003 100th, anniversary centennial um, was when it kind of hit me that, hey, this is, you know, a, a big deal. <laughs> all right. So we've got people tuning in from South Africa, New Zealand, all over the country. Thank you all for tuning in. And I've got a question for each of you that, that I just want to know. And also our viewers, I want to know from you, um, tell us about your first airplane flight. You know, I can vividly remember mine. My, my buddy and I got on an airplane when I was I think I was in college at the time when we flew to Chicago. What was your first airline flight? So comment that down in the comment section. Tom and Keith, what was your first airplane flight like? Uh, well, mine, I was a Cub Scout. And again, having grown up around the Air Force and an Air Force base, uh, they gave us a, uh, a ride, the Cub Scout troop, uh, from Wright Pat down to um, – a little place, Clinton County Air Force Base, uh, below Dayton and, and back. So that was my first. Keith, how about you? Yeah, so I don't remember my first flight because I was a toddler at the time. Uh, but from what I've heard, uh, it was a flight uh, from Texas to uh, Hawaii uh, to visit my grandfather who lived out there at the time. Uh, and that 
I was old enough to, to walk up and down the aisle and I was walking up and down and waving to everyone. Uh, and so I was a bit of uh, entertainment on that long flight. So. Nice. Nice. All right. We've got a question coming in and this is a, a big question that we get all the time at the museum. Um, and that is what model is the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's right flyer and what happened to the original flyer? So Tom, you want to, you want to take that one? Sure. That is the original flyer. The, when you go to the National Air and Space Museum, to the Wright Brothers Gallery, or with the Wright Brothers Gallery when the museum fully reopens, uh, the airplane that you see is the airplane that flew at Kitty Hawk on December 17th, 1903. Now, at the end, they only did four flights that morning, and at the end of the fourth flight, the airplane was damaged, sitting on the ground. The wind caught it and damaged it, not in flight, but when it was on the ground. So Orville had to put it back together. And when he did, um, he had to make some repairs and that kind of thing. So um, we, I usually say to people that what you're seeing um, is an airplane that's 75% what was at Kitty Hawk on December 17th, 1903. But beyond that, it's the world's first airplane, the way the inventor of the world's first airplane wanted you to see it, because Orville Wright is the one who put it back together the way it is today, the way you see it today. That's awesome. Um, you, you mentioned Cub Scouts. We've got PAC 1156 in Sterling, Virginia watching. Thank you all. We've got a few minutes left. So if you've got some questions, put them down into the comments section. And um, we've got uh, somebody wants you to talk a little bit about the journey that the flyer took and and London and the Smithsonian and kind of how did the how did the National Air and Space Museum end up with the right flyer? Because I always think that's a really interesting story. Yeah, well, it is a really interesting and very complicated story. Um, the Wright brothers and the Smithsonian uh, didn't have an immediate meeting of the minds. Uh, at the time the Wright brothers flew, uh, Samuel Langley, the third secretary or head of the Smithsonian, was trying to fly too. They succeeded. He failed. But because later Smithsonian people wanted to make their Samuel Langley looked really good. They weren't completely fair to the Wright brothers. And Orville Wright, uh, having tried to reason with the Smithsonian for a long time, 20 years, uh, finally said, well, okay, if that's who you guys are gonna be, he sent the world's first airplane to London where it was on exhibit at the Science Museum from 1928, really until, um, after World War II, um, the Smithsonian, one of the later secretaries, finally uh, admitted that Orville had been right all that time. And Orville at that point said, OK, the airplane can come home. So it was unveiled um, at the Smithsonian. The world's first airplane was unveiled there for the first time on December 17th, 1903. And, uh, Chuck Yeager, the famous Air Force pilot, earlier that year had broken the sound barrier with uh, the famous Bell X-1. And so that day when the flyer was unveiled, Chuck Yeager was there and it was a really big moment, not just for the Smithsonian, but for American aviation. It was a, a really big moment. That's awesome. Now, Keith, we've got a picture, if, if one of the guys doing the tech can pull it up, of a, of a pin that you've got um and there and we've actually got some pictures that your mom sent and by the way your mom is watching and she wanted me to say hi um so <laughs> so we've got pictures of that pen and you wearing that pen i think there's a picture of you with buzz aldrin and one with john glenn tell us what that pen is yeah uh so that pin the button uh is orville wright's naca identification badge so naca um was the predecessor to nasa uh, and it was the Oh boy, National Aeronaut. Uh, something. It was. I can't remember what the acronym is now. <laughs> I get too too many acronyms in engineering. But uh, um, it was the predecessor to NASA, um, and so he actually got the identification badge number one. Uh, and so those badges were something that anyone uh, in those programs would have had. So Neil Armstrong. Uh, I was wearing that around in um, 2003 and. When I met Neil Armstrong, he looked at it and said, oh, 
I had one of those. Uh, and so that, that was a pretty, that was a pretty cool moment. That is awesome. Um, Tom, somebody wants to know who Archibald Huxley was and, uh, want you to talk a little bit about Teddy Roosevelt and that story. Sure. Art Hoxie was one of the Wright Brothers exhibition team members. After they had invented the airplane, became famous, went to Europe and all that, they came back, they established um, an exhibition flying team, a bunch of pilots who would go from city to city, fairs and so on, demonstrating their airplanes. And one of those pilots was a guy named Artoxy. And in fact, in St. Louis, um, Teddy Roosevelt, after he had left office in 1912, was there as well. And Hoxie gave a flying demonstration and TR decided he wanted to go up in the airplane. And there are actually really neat movies it's hard to get into a right airplane of that era because of all the wires. And you can see Teddy kind of twisting around and uh, then you can see him in the air. And uh, so Teddy Roosevelt with Artoxy became the first ex-president uh, to fly in an airplane. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got uh, a couple of more packs that are watching. Pack 107 from Southwest Louisiana, Pack 574, and Special Needs Troop 555 in Mockville, North Carolina. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We appreciate it. We've got a few more minutes left. Um, somebody wants to know what Orville's reaction to airplanes being used as bombers and as weapons. What, what did he think about that? Somebody... Uh... After all, Orville uh, lived through World War I and World War II. And uh, of course, during World War II, uh, the airplane as a bomber uh, was an important part of the conflict. And after the war was over, someone actually asked Orville if he wasn't a little bit sorry that he created a machine that had caused so much destruction. And his answer was, well, you know, fire has caused enormous destruction in human history. But all things considered, it's better that we had fire than if we didn't have fire. And that's the way he felt about the airplane. Awesome. Keith, can you talk a little bit about what you're currently working on? You're an engineer right now and you're doing some acoustical engineering, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm actually, so I just this week got the email that uh, my professional engineering license got approved. Uh, so I'm now a certified professional engineer in the state of California. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and um, so I'm in acoustics and uh, what I do is transportation acoustics. Uh, so that's mainly making sure that transportation is quiet and low vibration. Um, so a lot of my work lately has been up in Seattle. Um, they're really expanding their rail transit uh, near the University of Washington. It has a lot of sensitive research buildings and things like that. Um, it's really, you know, as a city that's expanding like Seattle, transit, maybe not in the time of COVID, but usually uh, rail transit and things like that are a very important part of, of a major city like that. Uh, but so is the research. So we help to keep things quiet uh, and low vibration so that people can sleep and that, that you know, these things are, are helpful to, to the world. Awesome. Uh, we've got a, a, a couple more questions coming in here. Um, were the Wright brothers nervous that somebody would beat them to powered flights since they developed their techniques over several years? Uh, they weren't really nervous. There were, while the Wright brothers were working on the invention of the airplane, other people were too. And one of those people, as I said, was a fellow named Samuel Langley, who uh, was the head of the Smithsonian. And he, I mean, was making headlines, New York Times and the Washington Post and all that. The Wright brothers were working away, unknown really to everybody else down in Kitty Hawk. And uh, Orville had to make, before they made that first flight on December 17th, to get some parts fixed, he had to make train trips back to Dayton. And during the last of those trips, he came back. And what he said to Wilbur was, well, Langley tried and failed. Now it's our turn. And uh, Langley, just seven days before the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk, had failed to fly for the second time. Uh, he tried in October and again in December. And uh, so the way was completely open for the Wright brothers. 
Wow. And that leads to, the, to another question. Um, somebody would like to know if there was a big crowd on that first flight that witnessed the very first flight. No, there were only five people, not counting Wilbur and Orville. Um, uh, when the Wright brothers were ready to try an experiment, uh, they had like a blanket that they would pin up on the side of the shed that they built. And the lifesavers, uh, in those days, there were life-saving stations all the way along the Outer Banks during the hurricane season. And the guys down at the Kill Devil Hills life-saving station would see it and they'd come up to help. So three of those guys uh, came up and uh, helped. And uh, there was a lumber salesman named Brinkley who was just passing by and stopped to see what was happening. And a young kid, a 13-year-old kid named Johnny Moore, uh, who lived just over the backside of the dunes who had come down to watch. So there were really, that was it in terms of witnesses for the first flight. We're lucky that Orville was uh, an amateur photographer. And before the flight, he had set his camera up on a tripod, pointed at the spot where he thought something would happen. And uh, one of the Coast Guardsmen, um, Orville gave the little bulb to operate the camera to him. And he said, you know, if you see anything interesting, squeeze the bulb. And so that Coast Guardman, John T. Daniels, uh, took the famous first flight, uh, the first flight ever of an airplane uh, in the air. That is awesome. Now, now, Tom, I do have to say, you know, we, we've shown a couple of uh, really old, a little bit on the embarrassing side pictures of Keith today. Um, we also have a picture of you from four years ago that we're going to show to our, our viewing audience. Um, it's Tom with, with both of my kids at Mount Vernon. And Tom, tell, <laughs> us, who, tell us who you were dressed up as there. <laughs> I am dressed up as the very first American to fly. Uh, long before the Wright brothers in uh, 1785, uh, a Boston doctor named uh, John Jeffries flew the English Channel in a balloon uh, with a Frenchman. And so uh, when Mount Vernon does their colonial fair every year, uh, a friend and I go out, we fly small hot air balloons and talk about the earliest history of flight uh, in America. So it's, it's fun to do. It was it was absolutely awesome. We were walking along and I I saw the the tent with the hot air balloon and of course I'm an air and space nerd so I walked over and I was like wait a minute that's Tom and we walked over and, and took those <laughs> pictures so um, so we we were able to get a couple of fun pictures of both of you guys in here. Well we're just about out of time today. I do want to encourage everybody to tune in next week. Um, next week is the first crewed launch from the United States since 2011, and we have a great chat lined up. We have one of our curators, Dr. Jennifer Lavasser. We also have Wayne Hale, who is a mission controller, as well as NASA astronaut Alvin Drew, who will be joining in that talk. And then the following week is the 55th anniversary of the first American spacewalk. And we'll have NASA's chief historian, as well as 10 times spacewalker, Michael Lopez Alegria joining us for, for that talk. So a couple of really fun chats uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. We'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. Tom, Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's fun. Thank you, and it's fun, yeah. And we're going to leave you today with um, a look inside the cockpit of a 787 Dreamliner. I got a chance to talk to one of their pilots, and I asked him at the end of this little interview if he thought the Wright brothers could fly that 787. The answer is kind of cool. Check it out. Thanks for watching. I'm joined by Kyle Whitaker, and we're in the cockpit of a 787 Dreamliner. Tell us what these controls do. Well, much like a, even a much smaller airplane, you have a yoke, which is how we kind of control our pitch. If you push forward, the nose will go down. You pull back, the nose will come up. Also, just like in a smaller aircraft, turn left, the ailerons will move and it'll cause the aircraft to roll to the left. Or if you turn to the right, it'll cause the aircraft to roll to the right. Also, these are our, what we call thrust levers, or these kind of our engine controls. You push them forward, the engines will rev up and create more thrust and allow the aircraft to move forward. And if you pull them back once you're in flight, it'll allow the aircraft to slow down. Also down on the floor are rudder pedals. You push them to the left and the aircraft will yaw to the left. And if you push the right pedal, it'll yaw to the right. Okay. Tell us, tell me what this is. 
it's a heads up display so what it does is it takes information from the navigation computers down here and puts it up here so you can always be focused outside of the window the wright brothers didn't have a cockpit um why such a complex cockpit well, I'll tell you what, they weren't traveling at 39,000 feet and almost 550 <laughs> miles an hour. If you were to take the Wright brothers and put them in here, and the technology is a little bit different, do you think they'd understand what was going on? I think they might be able to get the basics, but with a little training, they could definitely fly a 787. Is it fun to fly? It's a blast. Best, best job in the world. Lots of fun. Outstanding. Thanks for talking with us. Thank you.